Well, I want to welcome you again, <clears throat> excuse me, to Cross Community Church. Um, as Caleb said as we started, uh, our mission is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. And, th and that means that uh, quite naturally we don't stay the same. That means that there will be transformation in our lives and our heart will begin to look less and less like ourselves and more and more like Christ. And uh, if you just think about that on a, a broad scale, I think the world would be a better place if it looked less and less like me and a little more like Jesus. And so this morning I'm going to invite you uh, to, to hear the word of the Lord, to look into the scriptures, to, to hear the word that's preached, and just to say, God, have your will in me. Would you conform me to your image today? Now, what Paul is going to do today uh, is a little bit of clarification, or more um, specifically, he's going to be more specific. Uh, when I, well, a couple weeks ago, I, I had an opportunity to go to uh, my former boss's funeral, and uh, he was a larger-than-life guy. I mean, he was big, uh, but kind of that personality uh, always had a smile on his face, and yet he was one of those guys that when he spoke to you, he could smile and, and kind of laugh a bit, but you knew that you better do whatever he just asked you to do, like, rather quickly. That was kind of how it went. So this was me. Uh, I was beginning to learn how to hang sheetrock on this crew, and uh, you, you kind of start at the bottom. They let you carry the, the full sheets of sheetrock into the house and put them down, and they let you carry the scrap out when the experts were done. And so for me, I'd kind of done my time hauling sheetrock into the houses, taking the scrap out, and I was starting to get to, to work with a crew, you know, like they let you hang a little bit of sheetrock, they give you a knife, they, you know, a hammer and some nails, and so you get to start hanging sheetrock, which, by the way, is not a real privilege. Uh, it's just really hard work. But I, I thought, <clears throat> as a young man, like I've arrived, I'm starting to make progress, and I remember uh, being in a house and working with the crew one day, and Tommy, who was my boss, he looked at me and he says, Hey, I want you to take this piece, and I want you to throw it out there in that water. Uh, and, and so I was like, Okay, it seems a little strange that you would just want me to take a piece of sheetrock that's supposed to go in the house, throw it in the puddle. But um, second thing I didn't tell you, this crew worked at a furious pace. And so there was never like the... You never strolled anywhere. Anywhere you walked, you walked as fast as you could walk. You nailed as fast as you could nail. Anything that you did, you did as quickly as possible. That was just the pace. And so I'm not wanting to disappoint my boss. I take this sheet of sheetrock that I kind of seen him trimming on and all this. I didn't know what he was doing. Um, and I went to the back door and I threw it out in the puddle. At which time uh, I hear all the hammers stop hammering. And like there's no routers going. There's no noise. And everybody... Uh, on the crew has turned to look at me, and all of a sudden, my boss just burst out laughing. He's like, well, I guess you did what I said, didn't you? And I was like, yes, what is the big deal? Um, the thing that they all knew that I didn't know at the time is that in order to make sheetrock conform to curves uh, in difficult places, you can go wet it down a little bit, and that will make it able to, <clears throat> to bend and flex a little bit more. And so my boss did want me to wet the piece of sheetrock, but maybe not throw it out in the mud puddle. So he then had to go cut another piece, and I had kind of ruined things for him. It's an embarrassing uh, learning moment. Never did that again. I, I tell that story because that's a little bit of what's happening here uh, in Paul's text. He's having to speak with greater specificity about what he's, he meant when he spoke to the church uh, at Philippi earlier. He had told them to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. If you'll remember uh, back in chapter 1, <clears throat> conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Stand firm then in one spirit uh, of the same mind, like striving together for the faith of the gospel. But now he's going to write with greater specificity for what that's going to look like within the Philippians church. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, and he's going to be really, really clear about what it looks like to stand firm together, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In verse, or chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, and he says, in this way. This is the specificity, right? In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Your standing firm needs to look like this. Specifically, here's what I want you to begin to do. And then he does something that preachers are really not supposed to do, or at least that's how we would see it. He's going to call out a couple of ladies by name. Now, if Paul calls you out by name for something good, 
pretty remarkable, right? I mean, you're like, yeah, I was there. I was fighting the battle. Like, people throughout history are going to remember me. Uh, but these two ladies are going to be remembered as the ones who Paul had to write specifically, put their names in a letter to tell them to get over their disagreements. Look what it says here in verse 2. He says, I urge you, Odia and Syntyche, to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So um, an interesting thing here, uh, Paul never holds back rebuking false doctrine. Like, you read Paul's letter to the Galatians, and he's, he calls them fools. He's like, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? How have you turned aside to following some other gospel? Like, Paul never holds back when doctrine needs to be corrected, which suggests that the thing, the conflict between Euodia and Syntyche here was not doctrinal. This was not like core beliefs of Scripture, whether Jesus was the Son of God. This was not one of those things. It was likely an issue over a small offense. Maybe it was personal preference. Maybe they just come into disagreement over some secondary issue. And yet, this conflict between these two women was so significant that it had reached the ears of Paul, who was hundreds of miles away in a Roman prison. And it is such a severe conflict, and it was so costly to the Philippian church, that now he's going to write their names in a letter and send it back. This is a couple of months of travel time just for Paul to be able to get word that it happened and then send word back to the church. This was of profound importance to Paul. He saw this of, as extremely important for the Philippian church. So he urges these women to agree in the Lord, to live in harmony with one another. Now, we might think also about these ladies, that they were just kind of, they're gossips, they're troublemakers, they're divisive. Maybe they're just some shady women who came in the church or something, but that's not the case either. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in verse 3 that these women, they're believers, their names are written in the book of life. He goes on and describes these ladies as women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. So for Paul, if you'll remember, when he went into Philippi, he shows up to a city where there's no synagogue, there's no believers. He ends up um, preaching the gospel to a group of women who is gathered by the river, just a place of prayer. Given that he was familiar with their first names, that he identifies them as those who have struggled with him for the cause of the gospel, it is possible that Euodia and Syntyche were some of the earliest converts in the city of Philippi. These were godly women. Names written in the book of life, striving together with Paul and in his struggle for the gospel. And yet they find themselves in a place of conflict. So Paul says to them, all right, we, I told you about standing firm. I've told you about conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, here's what that needs to look like for you. This is where Paul is going. So he says, I urge you to live in harmony in the Lord. You know what Greek word he used there for the live in harmony? It's one he's, he's used already over and over throughout the Philippian letter. The Greek word phreneo means to have the same Mind As he was calling on the Philippians to live in unity with one another, be of the same mind, one spirit. He says, have this attitude or this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He used the Greek word phreneo, and so he's calling them back. Again, if you want to know what I meant when I told you to stand firm, to be in one mind and one spirit, to be unified together, here's what it looks like. It's time to resolve the conflict that's carried on between you. Now, it's likely, as I said before, this was a, an issue over some offense that had come, over a secondary issue, a conflict that these two women had entered into, uh, but it was really severe, so much so that Paul calls on his true companion, and you can debate about who the true companion was. Some people think it was Epaphroditus, other people think it was Luke, but he says to a true companion, like, I want you to get these women together, and I want you to work this out. The Greek word he uses for help there is the word used when they arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the word used when you caught a fish. He's saying, bring these two women together and don't let them go until they have resolved this conflict. 
you know, sometimes when we have conflict, issues with our brothers or sisters, or we decide to put our preferences above those of our fellow man or woman, and we think, you know, it's really not a big deal. We're, we're just a couple of people in the body of Christ. It's not a huge thing at all. It won't matter. Maybe this will go away over time. You know, it doesn't have to affect anyone else. Let me just tell you, Paul thought it was a big deal for conflict to exist in the church. So much so, they would write out the names of the people in conflict in the letter, and he would tell his fellow companion, work this thing out for them. He's like, you want to know what it looks like to stand firm in the Lord? And don't, don't just talk about the right things. Don't just say you're going to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. This is where the rubber meets the road. You need to be reconciled together. Like this division has got to end. And he was very specific with them. Now, I wonder what that would look like for us. A couple of thousand years later, a small church in a small town in America. But we happen to live in a culture of constant offense. Where if someone doesn't speak to you the correct way, or someone didn't greet you, or maybe you didn't get your way, or your preferences weren't catered to, I wonder what Paul would say to us, how he would phrase this for us, that we might understand that it is completely unacceptable for someone who has been reconciled to God, for someone who has been a recipient of the gospel of Jesus Christ to continue on in conflict, refusing to be reconciled with their fellow brother or sister. Point number one I want to give you today for us as believers in Jesus Christ, how we can live out our faith as the church here in this place at this time. Number one, when unity has been broken by personal conflict, we are to be reconciled in a spirit of gentleness. When he says, utters the Greek word phreneo, be of the same mind, he, he tells them, have this attitude, be of the same mind as Christ, who humbled himself and became a bond slave, who was obedient even unto death and death on a cross. He calls on them not to look out for their own interests, but for the interest of others, to do nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit, but instead to consider others as more important than themselves. Can I ask you a very specific question for you? We've all been through conflict. We've all had relational struggles. What would it look like for you to be obedient to what Paul is calling us to in this text? What would it look like for you to pursue unity in the midst of your personal conflict? Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives us a prescription for dealing with brokenness in a, in a church. He says, hey, if your brother sins against you, you should go and show him his fault. But you know what often happens? It's probably a similar thing to what happened with you, Odia and Sintiki. Pride sets in. He should have known that he crossed the line. He needs to come and apologize to me. She should have known better than to say that or to do that. What happens is we dig in in our pride on both sides. And Paul has already told us, like, hey, uh -uh, that's not how this works. You humble yourself as Jesus did. You serve one another as Jesus did. You don't think about yourself and your best interests. You think about theirs. Go and be reconciled to your brother. I was uh, 22, 23 years old, and I just started in full-time ministry, and uh, I, you never know what you're getting into, by the way, when you interview with a search committee, going to a church, you have no real idea uh, what's going on in that body, because they're going to tell you things are pretty good. I mean, everything's great, it's rosy, you know, so I'm, I'm young, and I'm excited to go and serve in ministry, felt God had called me there, and so I went, and within the first three or four months, things went really south in that church. There was a lot of division. Um, there was not a division over a doctrinal issue. There was not a division over someone with open sin in their life. There was division over personal preferences. Some people wanted this and other people wanted that. And I went through uh, my first church split. I could not tell you why that church split. I can't tell you like what the issue even was. But it was people who rather than doing what the scriptures had called us to, people who said, you know what, I'm, I'm not getting my way, so I'm going to leave. 
And I'll just tell you, our church suffered as a result. Godly men and women who I'd seen serve, who I knew loved Jesus Christ, but they didn't handle conflict in a biblical manner. They ran to the church down the street. They never reconciled their things, at least for a while. I remember a, a couple of years later, after the dust had settled, we had a revival at our church. And uh, one of those evening meeting kind of things, and there was a, a pastor who'd come in, <clears throat> and he was kin to one of the people who'd been on one side of the conflict that had left the church. And uh, this conflict had persisted in the church for a very long time. Uh, you felt it. You know, you live in the same town with people. And uh, pastor preached that night, and I remember when he finished. I couldn't tell you what he preached on, but I remember when he finished, I looked kind of on one side, and one of our deacons, who had been there for a very long time and stayed through the conflict, he gets up and goes to the other side of the sanctuary, and he goes to one of the men who had left, who happened to show up that night. I remember these two grown men, like they embraced each other and walked down to the front and began to weep. Somebody had the courage to go to his brother and say, listen, I'm sorry if I've offended you. Somebody had the courage to go and to be reconciled in a spirit of gentleness. And it was profound, not just the impact that it had on those two men and their families. It was profound, the impact that that little gesture of reconciliation had on our entire church. So Paul would say, listen, I told you to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. To stand firm in the midst of difficulty, striving together for the faith of the gospel. If you're going to do that, you've got to be reconciled. And he tells us how. Verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now, I don't know about you. It is totally, listen, I, I feel pretty good about this. It is almost effortless to let my gentle spirit be evident to some men. You know those people that are just easy to get along with? Like, you just hang out, and it's effortless. It goes so well. Like, that's not a whole lot of people for me. I'm, I'm kind of controversial at times, right? It's not easy for me to live uh, uh, in gentleness with all men. There's a few people that it, it does go really well, but Paul is, is pretty specific here. Like, this gentle spirit is to be evident to all men. This word gentleness, by the way, it's, it's one of those Greek words that we don't have a great English equivalent for. And so I'm going to give you a few words to describe what Paul is talking about when he says, like, let your gentle spirit be evident. Um, it's, it's the word gentle. It means yielding. This is not digging in your heels, making the other person come grovel back. Like, uh, it's not the passive aggressive, like, uh, they should figure out what's wrong, or you're going to have a, an attitude, or you're not going to speak to them. This is yielding. This is humility. It's kind. It's lenient. It's forbearing. It's being as Christ, who even though he was the one who was sinned against, he had no sin. He went to the cross for us. So we as the people of God, we're going to let our gentleness be evident. We're kind. We're lenient. We're gracious. We're merciful to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, you may think, okay, I'm not seeing all this with regard to the church. How does this relate to the church at Philippi? Seems like it was just a couple uh, of women. Uh, but what you need to know about the church at Philippi, uh, Paul had told them, hey, it has been granted to you. Like, the, you have this opportunity to believe in Christ. But it's also been granted to you to suffer on his behalf. Paul says, you're going to suffer as you've seen me suffer. Within the church at Philippi, they'd watched as Paul had been arrested. These early believers watched as he was arrested and, and beaten with rods. He was thrown in an inner prison. He'd been beaten with rods. It's possible that his bones had been broken. His flesh was scarred. And he didn't even get any medical treatment. And this is the environment that the church at Philippi had to go and represent Jesus Christ in. Because Paul dared declare the gospel... Because Paul dared to live for Jesus Christ and then be with rods and thrown in prison. He's like, hey, if you're going to stand firm, man, disunity, isn't, it can't be present. It can't last. You've got to be united. 
to these ladies, you got to get it figured out. If you need this guy to help you, get it figured out. Be reconciled to one another in a spirit of gentleness. But that wasn't the only threat of Philippi. I told you there was persecution that was going on. And, and this is not like, it feels really distant to us. We happen to live in America where we're free to gather. Like our biggest struggle at times in living out our faith is, do I get up early when it's a time change Sunday, right? We don't necessarily feel what they might have felt in a place where living for Jesus, like openly declaring the gospel, uh, would not be looked upon favorably, that you could be punished for that. And so sometimes, like we make these, these texts overly simple to live out. Or we try to be like, in our context, it's not really that big of a deal, right? But in theirs, it was profound. Look at what he's about to tell them, living in a culture of persecution, that would see that Christianity is being unlawful. In verse 6, he says, be anxious for nothing. The word anxious is just, don't be worried, concerned, fearful. Hey, don't be worried about the persecution you might face. Don't be afraid of what might come to you. I know you've watched as Paul and Silas were beaten. I know that you've, you've seen when, when Paul was in prison. Don't be anxious about anything. Like, don't let that fear overtake you. When we give ourselves to anxiety, it's really hard to stand firm. It's really hard to strive together for the faith of the gospel. And so Paul says, be anxious for Nothing. Now, the good news uh, is he didn't just tell them to stop. Like, don't be anxious. Stop it. He gives them a prescription for how we should walk through this when we face this in our lives. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And so there's kind of a threefold process here. He kind of told them to pray three different times. Um, the first word for prayer is what you and I generally understand uh, to be praying. Just kind of bowing your knee before God. It's acknowledging that you can't handle whatever it is that you might be facing, that you can't control it. It's that you can't fix it. You can't overcome it. God, I'm going to bow my knee before you. Who can control it? Who is able? Who is powerful? That's just prayer by everything, by prayer. The second word here is petition. We know it as supplication. This is just presenting your request. It's just letting God, like, hey, God, here's the problem that I'm facing. I'm going to bring this and lay it at your feet. God, I'm, I'm concerned about my family living out their faith in this city. God, I'm concerned about our brother who's been in prison for his faith. God, I'm worried. These are the fears of my heart, and I'm going to bring them in supplication. We bring these requests before God. Like, God, I can't handle it, but you can. And then there's a third part of this call to prayer here. If we're not going to walk in anxiety or fear or worry anymore, the final piece here, with thanksgiving, we let our requests be made known to God. Bow on our knee, God. I can't do this, but I know that you can. God, here's what's concerning me. Here's what I'm worried about. And then it's, God, I thank you that you are good, that I can trust you with any outcome that's going to happen here. God, I trust that you're good. You're working this for good. You're working your purposes for our good as, as a body. You know, it was for good that Paul suffered in Philippi. It was for good that he spent time in prison. It was for good. It was for the good of the world that Jesus was betrayed, falsely accused, beaten, crucified. Sometimes our struggles are for good. And we can thank God that no matter what comes, what we might face, the things that might concern us, we lay it at his feet and say, God, we praise you because you are good. Because you're sovereign, because you know all. And if you allow it to happen, I'm going to trust that this is for your good. It's for your purposes. In a church that's facing persecution, division can't be tolerated. I mean, it can't be allowed to fester. It divides you. You're not going to stand together, striving together for the faith of the gospel if you're divided. And so when unity is broken by personal conflict, we're to be reconciled in the spirit of gentleness. 
Uh, Number two for us as the church of Jesus Christ, when fear and anxiety come in, when anxiety threatens to steal our joy, we find peace in prayer, thanking God that he has under his full control whatever it is that we might face. If you walk through it, it's because God allowed it and you can trust that he's going to work it for good, whether you see it and experience it or not. The final thing for a church in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulty, if we're to stand firm in one mind, in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel, if we're going to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy, we're going to be reconciled to one another. We're not going to walk in anxiety. We're going to walk in trust. And the third thing, we're going to meditate on what is good and begin to live out what we've learned. Rather than focusing on what might happen, the problems, the brokenness, the fears, the struggles, the weakness, instead Paul calls on us to meditate on what is good. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure and lovely, is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. This is where you fix your mind. Not focused on the problem, not the difficulty, not the struggle. We fix our minds on Jesus. We fix our mind on the things that are admirable and excellent. We fix our mind on the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And there's always a reason to praise, even in the midst of difficulty. If we're going to walk through a season of persecution as the church at Philippi did, we just keep thinking for reasons to praise God. It's what we do when we gather here and we sing songs of praise to, to Jesus for his work, for his worth. Like we honor him we're fixing our minds on the things that god has called us to fix our minds on not dwelling on the things that are broken and difficult the pain that we might endure we're focusing our minds on the things that are good and paul continues in verse 9 he says the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things there is no such thing as a theoretical knowledge of god If you truly know God and you've come to know his worth, it will impact your behavior. If maybe you're tempted to be a part of a church, uh, go and you listen to the sermons and you kind of go through the motions and, and everything you get in terms of God is something that happens only in your head but doesn't affect your hands. Like I would just encourage you to, to question, do you really have a relationship with Jesus? Has he given you a new heart? Has he begun to transform your life? Like we've lived in America that says, hey, just pray a prayer, walk an aisle, and you'll be good with God. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. But the Bible teaches that if we love God, we're going to obey him. But Jesus would say, hey, listen, if you're going to follow after me, it's going to cost you everything. I would just venture to guess that if if everything was taken away from your life, your life would look a little different, right? So Paul, hey, think on the good things. Put into practice. It's almost like, I'm not sure, this is just Jason maybe reading a little bit into the text here. Um, He says the things that you've learned, the things you've received, the things that you've heard, the things that you've seen, it's almost like, I've been trying to teach you like you've learned it, you've seen it, you've heard it, you've received it. Now start living this out. It's almost like there's a a measure of frustration in his life. He's like, I've I've called you to stand firm, and here you are divided. Striving together for the faith of the gospel, and you're letting conflict persist. I've called you to stand firm, and here you are. Like, you're you're fearful, you're anxious, you're worried. Well, Well, let's get busy praying. I've called you to stand firm, strive together for the faith of the gospel. Then fix your mind on the good things and begin to live out what I've taught. It's almost like this is Paul's final plea with them. Like, our faith isn't supposed to be theoretical. It's supposed to be practical. In James chapter 1, verse 22, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says, hey, Be careful to be doers of the word and not hearers only who delude yourselves. Wouldn't it be a shame to spend your whole life deceiving yourself, thinking you're totally killing it, like doing everything God wanted, but you've never actually put the word into practice, and so you've totally missed the boat. Jesus, like the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, that's the guy that builds a house, right? 
and he, and he actually built it on the rock. And when the, the storms of life come, the difficulties there, that house stands. But the one who hears the words of mine and doesn't put them in the practice is like a guy who builds a house. Now, from the outside, both houses look the same, right? They're just a house. But one is founded upon obedience to God's word. The other is founded merely on hearing. And when the storms come and the winds blow, that house falls with a great crash. And the same is true for our lives. Our faith isn't supposed to be theoretical. The rubber has to meet the road. We've got to begin living out our faith in the midst of a difficult world. I have an urgency to preach this message because perhaps at no, uh, uh, more than at any other time in my life, I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be persecuted for our faith. I don't think it's here. Like I said, maybe your biggest struggle today was getting up with an hour different time change, right? But I do think it's coming. That it's going to be a greater challenge to live out our faith in the midst of our culture. But what a joy for us to be able to stand up and be the church of Jesus Christ to suffer on behalf of the gospel, to offer ourselves in service to Jesus and our fellow man in the midst of difficult circumstances. But we as Cross Community Church, you and your home and the, kind of the captain of your life in terms of following Jesus, it's like we have an opportunity to make our lives obedient to the word. So every week when we conclude our, our sermon, we have a response time. And it's not just like an old school invitation where, you know, anyone who doesn't know Jesus can come up here and we can talk about it. This is time for you to do business with God. As the word is preached for you to say, okay, where, where is there conflict in my life? How can I make my life obedient to this? Is there a broken relationship where I need to humble myself? You won't humble yourself lower than Jesus, right? Where I need to not look to my own interests but to the interest of others. I need to pick up the phone. And I said, will you forgive me? Maybe for you, you've been walking in anxiety. Worried and fearful and concerned. Because all of your energy is going there. It's not going to striving together for the faith of the gospel. But today's the day you just bow your knees before God. You lay those things at his feet and you thank him for how he's going to work. had a conversation with a, a lady in our church this week who has been through more than her fair share. I mean, one of those stories where it was like one thing after another after another, trial after trial after trial, loss after loss after loss. And I, I called her because I knew um, she'd battled anxiety in her life. I knew this had been a struggle for her. But I called her because I'd watched her walk through loss after loss and trial after trial. And I watched her live this out in her life. The thing that, as I would talk to her along the way, and as I talked to her this week, the thing that she pointed to was not herself. It wasn't like some book she read. She's like, I, was, I just prayed over and over and over and over. We talked about this verse in particular. She put her faith into practice. And what a testimony it's been to watch her not live out in anxiety, but in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, presenting requests to the Lord. That's the victorious Christian life. And you may not see it. You may not have got to hear all the story, but that honors and blesses the heart of God when his people live out their faith. So right now, we're going to have a time of response. And the band is going to come and play. And wherever you are, whatever may be going on in your life, would you just prayerfully consider submitting yourself to the leadership of the Spirit in your life? To not walk anymore in fear and anxiety. No longer dwelling on the negative and the broken, but instead fixing your mind on the things that are, that are praiseworthy, the things that are pure, that are true, that are good. No longer just hearing, but beginning to live out your faith. Would you bow with me? Father, we're grateful for your word. And sometimes your word is just really, really prescriptive and practical in our lives. And so uh, this morning where that is true, I pray that we would be eager to put these things into practice as Paul has called us to. Lord, that we'd be eager to be obedient to your word. And God, I pray not just for this week, but the week after and the next. And every single day as we open your word and we see how you have taught us to live, we trust that this is indeed the path to life. Father, I want to pray specifically for where there's conflict, where there's relational brokenness, 
Today, I pray that you would begin a work of healing through a spirit of gentleness. Where there's anxiety, I pray, God, that that would be relieved, that instead you would replace it with your perfect peace. Father, where we're not living in obedience to your word, I pray that today would be the day that we begin to obey. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.